the light and landscape. It's just, it's just hard to, it's hard to capture really. Um, it's just, it's just so beautiful. 360 degrees, and it's all mountains. When I woke up on a plane and I saw all the mountains, I was just, I couldn't believe it. It's amazing. And I st I'm still wowed every time I, I come up on deck and I look around and I think, oh my god, I'm actually here. Certainly environments you think of as being incredibly pristine, like here in the Arctic, huh? I mean, they're still finding the same sort of microplastics that, that they might find on beaches in the southern UK. And it just shows that, it does show the global extent of the problem. This is a big, big eye opener when you're so far away and you see so much. For this message to be heard on the larger scale that we can get it heard, you need to be broadcasting it on all wavelengths. In terms of film, photography, art. Throwing facts at people is not necessarily the best way to make them sit up and pay attention. And I think there's been a real strength for the trip in that, that emphasis on kind of communication. The water, the sea, the Arctic is not outside of their houses, it's not outside of their world, it's part of their world and it's part of their home. Microplastics are a threat that are everywhere in the world. Um, there's a theory now that there's a, there's a sixth major accumulation in the Arctic. So a group of 14 wonderful people, whether they're artists, scientists, filmmakers, photographers, have all travelled up here to Svalbard um, to study microplastics in the Arctic Ocean to see really what is there and how much of a threat it's, it's, it's becoming. So that's why we're on board the Blue Clipper now and ready to set sail tomorrow. So there are five major ocean systems, um, circulation systems and currents. So plastic is travelled all around the world in these ocean currents. The, depending on the density of plastic, it can either float or sink. And the major problem is for those ones that float, they become, they get trapped in these ocean systems that necessarily aren't very visible because it's almost like a smog. And there's a theory um, that the Arctic is actually now holding one of those systems. Um, and because it's such a, you know, it's seen as this pristine wilderness that's beautiful and untouched and majestic and it's already so threatened from other threats as to climate change, global warming and sea level rise and we want to know really what effect plastic is having up here. I think really the question we're asking is, is what is invisible? What, what are the invisible threats up here? Um, Microplastics is the main one that we're looking at. So we are we're going to be doing trawls every day. We're hoping to get a baseline survey of the um, area of Svalbard to understand what plastics are, are where. So we'll be doing um, the trawls, getting samples, and then also taking them back to the lab once we finish the sale, and then trying to figure out using um, chemical analysis what plastic types they are, and then linking that back to where those plastics could potentially have come from. Yeah, so um, I'm just attaching the net, the end of the net, um, to the mouthpiece, which has the two flotation devices on. Um, so this will trawl through the water. This piece is quite heavy, but then we have a 300 micron mesh net. Um, and then the area which we'll be collecting our microplastics in is called the cod end. So that's this area here. Um, the cod end isn't actually on this piece yet because we try and reduce contamination and then we will attach the cod end to the end when we're ready to trawl but for now we're just getting set up so we're attaching this pole here and we'll be going over the port side um, and then we're trying to reduce the amount of weight that's attached to our pole so we'll, we rig up an A-frame system with ropes which will ensure that this can float at the surface um, and collect our microplastics for about a 20 minute trawl. So this zips on. Yes. There we are. So we have the cod end attached, so that's not going to come off now. Um, and then the, what will happen is, as the water flows 
through the end of the net. Um, the microplastics will get caught in this cord end. And then when we take it out, we can sample this and we will filter it through smaller mesh sizes and then we can take that back to the UK and analyze it. Guys, lean back a bit for me. We need to take out the tension on the... holding the net three meters away from the ship so that we didn't get any um, like any of the wake in the net so we were going through clean fresh water um, but unfortunately the bamboo I think there was just too much weight on the bamboo um, and that snapped so we're gonna have to rethink hopefully find another pole if not we'll just have to rethink our methods but the actual net itself was fine it was sitting in the perfect position in the water it was just there was far too much weight in it Tension in this one. More tension, we're gonna, they're the going to break. Line. Who's holding the trawl line? Yep. Uh -huh. A lot more tension than that. Can I get two people on that trawl line? That trawl line there, Tom's on. Sweat it. Two six, two six, two six. Stop. Pull. Shit. Chris, can we go slower? Back off a little bit. We need to pull it in. bamboo broke again, there wasn't enough tension in a lot of the lines and a lot of the ropes, so we're having to have a third attempt, third time lucky, so we found some steel poles that we're going to reinforce the bamboo with, and then we're probably going to have the trawl not so far off of the boat, so we've got a lot less length to have pressure on, so it should therefore be a little bit stronger, um, and then we'll try again. Fingers crossed.
Um, well, we found a piece of polystyrene, which is um, sadly something that you can find pretty much on any beach anywhere in the world, I think. Um, which is horrible stuff because it just breaks down into these millions and millions of little particles which never disappear. And they're very commonly eaten by wildlife, birds. They break down, the beads look like fish eggs and a lot of things eat them. And there's been a lot of anecdotal reports from the Arctic of uh, polar bears eating polystyrene, large blocks of polystyrene. We've got a piece of what looks like some sort of beam trawler tra tra net here and two bits of hard plastic. Um, you know, this is the trouble with plastic because it breaks down into these smaller pieces and you can't even tell what it once was or where it came from. Obviously part of some kind of container. But um, plastic gets into the ocean in so many different ways. It's very hard to determine the source and, uh, and how long it's been out there and where it originally came from or what it was. We'll carry on looking, see what else we find. How are we going to get this out? It's proper buried in here as well. It's a piece of wood behind yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's clearly plastic. So this is a nurdle, this is a pre-production 
industrial plastic pellet. So all of our plastics, everything that we use in our daily lives are made from stuff like this, which is manufactured and shipped around the world and then taken to plastics factories, melted down and just formed into our plastics objects. Um, I'm really, really surprised to find something like this this far north. I just don't know where that could have come from. That is really, really shocking. Amazing. Oh. So we've brought everything back to the boat now that we collected on the beach and now we're sorting it into different categories um, according to the OSPAR protocol. So this is a system which is used internationally to um, uh, categorise beach related litter so that could be quite useful. Um, and uh, it is interesting because we're just finding that so much of the stuff is pretty much the same as at home. Um, but as you can see a lot of it is just broken up fragments so you would never be able to tell what it was originally or where it came from. So these things have to be categorised just by size, um, whereas a lot of other things like the cigarette lighters and the cotton bud sticks and the bottle tops and the fishing floats and things like that go into their own category. Um, so we're just down to the nitty gritty now and the really small bits. We've got some strapping bands here. Um, we've got a Norwegian um, margarine tub. We've got pieces of rope and string. Over there, we've actually got a big piece of a fishing crate from Stornoway in Scotland. Um, I very much doubt that people from Stornoway come up here fishing, so that's probably going to have floated over here on current. And um, one thing I think is really interesting is this. This is um, bark from a birch tree. We found loads and loads of this on the beach. Um, but obviously there's no trees at all on Svalbard. And the nearest birch trees are probably going to be northern Norway or Siberia. So this is sort of clear evidence of how things travel around on the currents. Um, if you're getting the natural debris, the plastic debris can travel in just the same way. So the primary objective of the expedition was to investigate the invisible pollutants in the Arctic. But our other aims were obviously to communicate this to the general population as best as we could. So we've got artwork going on, illustration and writing, we've got photography and we've got film. And it's the collaborative nature of the expedition that is going to increase our audience. So we've got the research which will go to the academic community. We've got our film and our illustration and photography that can go to the general population, but then we're even hitting the, the younger generations with the storybook that Jess is making. So in this way we don't really have a demographic because we're targeting everybody. We want everybody to know the message from the Arctic. So my name is Jamie Haig, I've been a UAV operator for a few years and given the beauty of the place we're going, capturing what we're doing from the air is going to give it a very unique perspective and, and, and kind of show off the surroundings and what we're doing in a, in a different way to the other guys on the film team who I think are predominantly ground filming and photography. My name's Ben Porter. My primary passion is in wildlife and in photography as well. One of the, the key targets for me, particularly on this expedition, is trying to get those really eye-catching images that will be able to convey some of the things that we're finding and some of the issues that we're trying to publicise through this expedition. It's a story, but what I really wanted was to bring those two together and to have this story and to have this problem of plastic pollution and really merge them together. And I think everybody on this boat wants their outreach to have an impact but that's the reason why we're here and that's the reason why we've got such a diverse team is that in each of our fields we want to we want to show like what is happening in the you know we want to show that there is plastic up here and and I do want to do that and I but I, I want to do it in a really beautiful way but also like convey that message at the same time.
So plastic itself isn't, um, plastic is a wonderful thing. I think that's the thing that people are often confused by. Plastic is, a, is one of the cheapest, most hard-wearing, versatile materials that we are, we're ever going to make. Um, it's the single-use plastic that's the threat. Um, so the average life of, the average working life of plastic, I think, is about 15 minutes. And most of that then is thrown away and makes its way to the ocean. So um, plastic itself can be obviously highly damaging if it's ingested. Um, species can get entangled in nets that are left out at sea. So there's a direct threat there, but also indirectly through the chemicals that they can um, have. So when plastics are made, they're, they're plastics and, and chemicals are added to make them in the form that they need to be used in. These can be highly damaging to any life that they come across. Also plastic is what's called hydrophobic, so it doesn't mix well with water. So any toxic um, material or any toxic pollutants that are in the water will attach to the plastic, which then they act as little toxic bombs just floating around the ocean. So they're both taking in pollution and giving out chemical pollutants as well. And that's another major threat to the species that they come across. There's things such as um, hormone disruptors, so these compounds, and they can create changes in estrogen levels in a lot of species. So fish have been shown to change gender. Um, or preventing fish change gender because a lot of species do that um, and then uh, consequently it's making its way into human diet as well for, this, for people that eat seafood it's predicted you eat about 11,000 pieces of plastic on average a year if you eat just general seafood two to three times a week so I think that's a staggering amount because it's, it's just this, it's the tiny stuff that's the most damaging. These persistent organic pollutants, you have things like uh, um, insecticides and flame retardants, things like DDT and PCBs, bromines and things like this which end up in the water. They were, most of them were banned decades ago but because they do have this persistent nature they're still out there, yeah. they don't break down um, and they are hydrophobic in nature so they don't want to be in the water, they would much more readily attach to something um, fatty, they're lipophilic. So um, obviously plastics being made from oil, they tend to accumulate in very high levels on marine plastics. Sometimes at levels sort of thousands or millions of times higher than the concentration in the background water, which is what sort of creates this double whammy effect when marine wildlife eat the plastic, because it's not just that they're being bunged up by the plastic and um, you know potentially eating so much that they no longer get the signals to the brain to feel yeah. hunger and want to feed or forage. Um, actually the, the toxins that are adhered to the surface of these plastics will leach out into their own body fat and accumulate there. And you can get these very high levels of, of compounds like PCBs, which then as you go up the food chain become biomagnified and then the top predators can be at extremely high levels which can have, have an impact on um, reproductive success and um, all sorts of other things, endocrine disruption. So we're just going to go through the samples um, and analyse them to 
see how much, many microplastics we've got in our microplastic tooling net. Yeah, so we're finding small pieces of fibres that we're getting in there. Um, there, most of our tools are coming up with that. So they could be from ropes or from um, pieces of clothing or any polyester. We, we're not sure whether these are definitely plastic yet. We need to take them back to the labs and analyse them. Um, but the colours and the texture of them would indicate that they potentially are plastic. So we've just done our last trawl of the trip and um, that went really well. We've got the rigging sorted now so it's a it's perfect trawl. Um, we're now sorting it through here to, through different sieves and then we're going to be taking it back to the UK for an further analysis with the rest of the sample. I feel ecstatic that we've managed to get this far um, because it's been such a feat um, to bring all these people together and people from different backgrounds, from different countries. So we've had people from the UK, from New Zealand, um, from Switzerland and we've all managed to come together in the Arctic and we've managed to come to some conclusions and have some time together to really figure out what we want to combat and how we want to portray what's going on here and, and really get the message out there. I think turning up on the beaches and doing the beach clean, especially the first few that we did, the first time you picked up plastic on this pristine beach which was miles away from anyone, I mean we hadn't seen human life for uh, days and then you turn up on a beach which is, was actually right inside a fjord that was protected by a spit of land. Um, we found pieces of plastic that had obviously been interacted with animals that were in that environment so they had teeth marks and potentially some of them could have caused entanglement or been ingested by animals in that region. Um, so that was really shocking to just find those pieces. I mean, we found a bottle top that um, had Korean writing on, so that potentially could be from a ship that's passing by, but it could also potentially have come from a different country. And all of these items um, might not necessarily come from local sources. It really connects us to the fact that these are coming from um, elsewhere and being washed up onto the beaches through the tide or through um, interactions with the ocean circulation systems. If we try to buy things that have been produced locally, not only are we decreasing the transport, but normally they don't come in all that plastic wrapping. And it's also getting in with local organisations and charities doing your bit to help cleaning up and doing doing your bit to educate, doing your bit to to encourage other people to live the way that you, you feel you should be, to have a positive impact on the earth. I mean, it sounds like adjusting the economics of it is really what needs to be done. It's We're talking about like private kind of profits and then a public cleanup cost. We use shampoo bars and soap bars and they don't come in any containers and if we think about just the number of bottles that we use for shampoo, conditioner, shower gel is not, is not only more practical for travelling because it's not liquid and you can take it anywhere but it doesn't cause any waste, there's no plastic in it and that's just such a simple thing and the more and more we can buy that does not come in plastic wrapping, the best. Once you start looking around, there's a lot of changes that can be made pretty easily without without putting yourself out, I think, um, that can, can really help 
sort of stem the tide and, and stop stuff going into the oceans.